Professor Lee, thank you so much. We're just delighted and honored that you've agreed to join us for this interview. Uh, it's interesting that you and I have known each other for several years now. And in fact, you've appeared in my class virtually to my students at one moment. And since that time, several years ago, my students have cited your work in their papers almost more than anyone else. So <laughs> That's very kind of them. So, and then you and I also, we share a common interest in missionary photography. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the point here really is, all, is for you to do most of the talking. So uh, let me just say a couple words about you uh, for those who might by some miracle not know who you are. Uh, first, your, your scholarship has been instrumental in our field and in influencing how we think about the study of Christianity in China. Uh, the most popular book I know of that people read is your book, The Bible and the Gun, which is one of the, and I think one of the greatest book titles in our field. Uh, you've also published, interestingly, on Hong Kong and Bollywood, uh, which I think so many people were rather surprised that you're <laughs> connecting these two things, but people were delighted with that work. And then you're still publishing on the history of Christianity in South China. Um, but really, let's just go on to the first question. And, and we're, you know, as you know, we're asking everyone the same question. But the first question, really, Professor Lee, is what brought you to the field? of China Christianity studies. And in addition to what brought you to the field, why are you attracted to the particular areas about which you research? Okay, thank you, Professor Krug. I think that's actually a wonderful way, you know, to have a dialogue and conversation, you know, during this long period of lockdown. Uh, I think, you know, uh, I really enjoy, you know, uh, you know, working with you on many occasions before. Uh, and I think regarding, you know, my own personal interests and also intellectual growth, uh, I always like to, you know, connect my scholarship to my own personal upbringing uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, I actually came from a Chinese, you know, immigrant family in Hong Kong. My parents actually came from the southern part of China uh, in an area called the Chaozhou in Guangdong province. Uh, so as I was growing up, you know, as a kid, uh, I heard many stories about uh, my ancestors, you know, connection with the local Baptist church and also the local Catholic church uh, on my father's side. Uh, basically, you know, my father came from a village uh, called Li. Uh, the entire, you know, community, you know, share the same surname, Li. And, and I think in that village, you know, you actually have two different divisions who subscribe to two, diff two different, you know, Christian tradition. Uh, one joined the Catholic church, one joined the Baptist church. Uh, as I was growing up, you know, I heard all these kind of story, but I have no understanding uh, of the historical context. Uh, and I remember when I first visited, um, you know, his hometown, uh, there was actually just sometime right at the end uh, of the Cultural Revolution. Uh, I was actually quite impressed by, you know, all these elderly, you know, relative, uh, whom later I understood they were the Bible woman. Uh, they were actually asking me some very interesting question about, you know, uh, my understanding of the Bible. Uh, and sometimes they also test my knowledge of English as well. Uh, I think at that time I was basically just a primary school kid. Uh, so I have, I grew up with all these kind of question, you know, how come a tiny little village, you know, in the southern part of China have this, you know, interesting sense of curiosity, you know, about the West and also about the Western, you know, Christian culture. Um, and later on, I think I, I'm always interested in history, you know, as I was growing up. Uh, so I choose to major in history at, uh, at, 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 at uh, I think in my undergraduate you know, education. And later on, I pursue my master and also my PhD program. Uh, and I think on one interesting occasion, I uh, basically just, you know, look at some kind of, you know, uh, you know biography about the missionary figures. Uh, and also, you know, studying, you know, the history of, you know, the Western imperialism in China. And I, and, and I basically just discovered some diplomatic papers uh, related to my father's home village. Uh, so I think from that moment onward, I just realized that, you know, the Christian movement, uh, it is also not just connected to my own family history, uh, but it is also connected to a much wider context of, you know, Chinese, you know, foreign political and also cultural encounter as well. Uh, so in terms of my personal academic interests, uh, I think you mentioned about the book, you know, The Bible and the Gun, you know, it was actually based on my doctoral dissertation uh, that I did, you know, in the late 1990s at the School of Oriental and African Study uh, in the University of London. Uh, 
so uh, I, I think that you know, a, a manuscript it actually looked at the origins of uh, the Christian missionary expansion in the Chinese. It, it, I think in the Chinese, uh, you know, um, interior. Uh, but, and also to look at, you know, the origins of the Christian village community uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, but later on, I think as I, you know, get a chance, you know, to come to the United States to develop my teaching career, uh, I also got many opportunities to interact with faculty members uh, from, you know, uh, media and also communication study. Uh, so that's also, you know, draw my attention to uh, some other interesting area of scholarship like um, you know the history of Hong Kong and Bollywood cinema and also how uh, some of the creative you know filmmakers you know try to use uh, you know media technology to address you know social political and also religious issue as well uh, so I'm also you know interested in you know the cinematic representations of religion uh, and also you know spirituality in film as well yeah, so, so that's actually the intellectual connection between my uh, earlier work on history of Christian missionary movement uh, and also the media uh, industry, yeah. Right. You know, you mentioned something interesting. You mentioned the, the village. The, the, I presume it's called Li Cun. Yep. Li village. And um, uh, you, you mentioned that there is this division, this bifurcation. And before we get to the next question, this bifurcation between the, the Baptist and the Catholic. Interestingly, in Chinese, of course, today we say Tian Zhu Jiao and Ji Du Jiao. There's no such thing as a denominational uh, distinction. But certainly, they still do. They still hold to that identity as Baptist or Ji Du Jiao. That's actually a very good question. I think you know. Um, I think since the late, uh, in fact, I think since the missionary actually came into China, they uh, used different you know vocabulary to talk about you know the Catholic you know tradition uh, and also the Protestant tradition as well. Uh, I think nowadays in those villages, uh, you know, I got a chance to visit them, you know, almost every two or three years. Uh, I began to notice that, you know, they still to hold on to uh, this, you know, uh, historical Baptist identity. Uh, I think they understand, you know, the Baptist origins of their, you know, Protestant faith. But of course, nowadays, you know, uh, they basically join the free self patriotic churches. Uh, so basically, I think in public, they also talk about, you know, their uh, officially sanctioned uh, Protestant identity. But definitely, I would say in their own, you know, local indigenous church history, they always want to highlight that, you know, connection with the American Baptist missionary movement. Uh, and, and I would say in their everyday practice, I think people also notice the difference between uh, the Catholic uh, tradition and also the general Protestant tradition. Uh, for example, you know, the way they talk about, you know, the Virgin Mary, uh, the way they talk about Jesus, you know, they, they, they tend to, you know, refer to this uh, spiritual icon as total, totally separate, you know, uh, deities. Uh, so I think that it's also one of the legacy of the missionary movement as well. Uh, so once it actually gets to the local area, it could just move into many different directions. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned... Uh going back to Chaozhou or going back to, uh, I guess you've been to Li Chun. they still call it Li Chun? Uh, yeah, they do, they do. Yeah, I, I think they still have, uh, I think they still use the historical name. Uh, I, I think the name of the village is called uh, Gu Xi. Uh, basically, you know, uh, by translation, um, uh, ancient river, uh, but I think the original name actually means, you know, the river of hardship, uh, mainly because, you know, uh, it is an overcrowded area, people were fighting for limited resources. Uh, so I think once the missionary came in, uh, people could just, you know, try to draw on the foreign military, um, political and missionary resources uh, to empower themselves. Right. Well, I wonder then if we could move to the next question, if you might describe uh, any moment of discovery that might have changed, you know, while you're doing your research, that might have changed how you think about your topic? Um, I would say one interesting moment related to my, you know, uh, doctoral research is actually when I discovered those, you know, published American diplomatic papers. Uh, uh, basically, I think I, I did not realize that, you know, a tiny little incidence of Christian sectarian violence it actually become a major diplomatic cases uh, in the late 19th century. So that was, a, that was actually the time just 
uh, right after the Sino-Japanese War. Uh, so basically, there was a growing sense of tension and hostilities towards the foreign presence, you know, basically in many different parts of China. Uh, and, and I would say both the Baptist and the Catholic, they were actually caught uh, in that kind of, you know, environment. Uh, but at the same time, you also have some very politically proactive villages. Uh, they want to hijack the situation, you know, to enrich and also to empower themselves. Uh, so when I look at those diplomatic papers, it just get me to rethink, uh, you know, the whole political meaning and also maybe the political implication of the Sino-Christian encounter. And later on, when I revisit those villages, I was actually very surprised by the architectural presence uh, of uh, some of the Christian, you know, settlements and also the Christian uh, home. Uh, so I think from that moment onward, I would just realize that it was also more than a case of uh, traditional, you know, jiawan, you know, those traditional anti-Christian cases. Uh, because, you know, even many, many years after uh, the diplomatic incident, uh, people still hold on to their Catholic and Baptist identity. And they continue to do so even after 1949. Uh, so I began to see, okay, there was the past, but there's also a historical continuity of the Christian missionary movement as well. Uh, so I would say from that moment onward, I become more interested in the whole subject about, you know, the ongoing conversion uh, and also the identity formations among the future generations of the Christian convert. Mm -hmm. um I, I'm, I'm right now sort of puzzling on one interesting thing about your own personal life of scholarship, and that is uh, a family history in southern China from a village named after your surname. <laughs> so, and then, and then uh, very much having connections to Hong Kong, writing a dissertation in London, and then moving to the United States. So this, the very the global sweep of your life of research uh, is, is, is quite unique and I think has probably informed how you think about your topic quite a lot. Um, one question we've asked everyone then though is if you can recall, and you've already in a way intimated about your, into your experience in, in China, but was there ever a, a, a particular moment, a meaningful moment that you experienced while in China doing your research uh, in terms of research or just in terms of interpersonally? Anything about your, your, your experience in China that, that we should that we should hear about? Um, I always remember, you know, the moment when I did my archival research, uh, basically when I did my archival research uh, in Guangdong. Uh, I think at that time, uh, it was the late 1990s, it was relatively easier to access uh, any type of historical materials before and even after 1949. Uh, so I remember, you know, I was actually, you know, doing my work in uh, Shantou and also in Shanghai Municipal Archives. Uh, I actually discovered a number of, you know, folders, you know, on a historical figure called Watchman Lee. Um, as I remember, I grew up, you know, in a Lutheran church in Hong Kong. I came across, you know, many popular spiritual writing, you know, written by that guy. Uh, but I know very little about his, you know, history at that moment. Uh, so I Xeroxed those material because I think those material actually refer to Watchman Lee as some kind of, you know, uh, a revolution, uh, uh, sorry, a reactionary figure. Uh, so basically those are classic example of police uh, persecution materials, you know, that actually condemn, you know, this church leader. Uh, so at that time I didn't think too much, so I collect the materials uh, and and then many, many years after I finished my doctoral thesis, I began to revisit, uh, you know, some of those, you know, folders. Uh, and, and, and also since I came to the United States, I first taught at a university in Florida. And I run into many, many, you know, local students who came from a strong uh, Methodist background. Um, and they often ask me questions about, you know, uh, the history of Watchman Lee. Uh, so it is also interesting as well when you think about this, you know, global circulations of, you know, Christian ideas, uh, you actually have one, uh, you know, early 20th century, you know, Protestant figure whose writing, you know, a watchman, I mean, uh, whose writing is widely read, 
uh, by the Christian, you know, from around the world. Uh, so I think from that moment onward, I began to take, you know, seriously, you know, uh, you know, uh, I think Watchman Lee, and also began to revisit those, you know, persecution material, and 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 later on, I think I published a number of articles, you know, on his own, um, you know, experience, you know, in the early nineteen fifties. Uh, so I would say. Um, I would say before that, you know, when I think about, you know, the whole church and state relations after 1949, uh, I think we tend to subscribe to a much more, you know, simplistic, you know, understanding, either resistance or co-optation. Uh, but as I get into some of this, you know, archival materials or persecution record, I just realized there was a lot of, you know, moral dilemma and also personal struggle. Uh, you know, facing not just, you know, senior church leader like Watchman Lee, uh, but also many other ordinary Christian as well. Uh, so I would say, you know, from that moment, I still uh, remember that moment of, you know, archival discovery. And it also get me to think carefully about what life was like for people, you know, in the 1950s. You know, basically that was, you know, the time of regime consolidation and also, you know, how, you know, religious minority and also how, you know, some kind of marginalized group, how do they try to fit themselves into a new political state? And if they fail to do that, uh, you know, what would be the consequences? And also what kind of sur uh, survival strategy do they develop uh, to protect themselves and also to protect their loved one? Right. You know, you mentioned something you me that, that I think is very significant uh, that can be made into a significant point, and that is you mentioned your discovery about Ni Tuoshang, about Watch yeah. Me. Yeah. And uh, interestingly, uh, in the past, I've heard you know scholars say, well, the history of Christianity in China is really, is it, is it, they ask the question, is it a relevant topic to study? Um, and here in Eastern Washington, there is a Chinese church dedicated to Watchman Nee and his oh. legacy. So okay. the reach of someone like this person you, you researched, Watchman Nee, uh, ha has extended globally in ways that, that the scholarly community I think really would benefit learning about. We've also mentioned something else, and that is uh, briefly you talked about um, doing archival research then. Uh, and I would say that documents on Ni Tuosheng might be bijiao mingan, might be a little sensitive. Mm -hmm. uh, but you mentioned that it was easier to do archival work then than maybe now. Can you just expand a little bit on that before we go to the next question? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, but basically, when you think about the archival you know, policies in China, I, 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 I would say in China, I think they do have a very comprehensive, you know, archival regulation, uh, which is very professional, which is extremely, you know, well drafted and also well organized. Uh, but once it actually comes down to the implementation of the archival access, uh, you often see things change in, in, in uh, and, and, and things change uh, from place to place and also from time to time. Uh, I would say, you know, given the current political climate, um, I think it might be a little bit more challenging for foreign and even for, uh, you know, mainland Chinese scholar to access material, uh, you know, during the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, but still, um, if you could not actually access those material uh, related to uh, religious affairs or maybe the policing affairs or the gongan, the public security affairs, uh, perhaps you can actually look at, you know, some other so-called non-sensitive uh, departments, uh, public health, education. And I think from there, you know, occasionally you would also find some interesting material about the legacy of those, you know, Christian medical and also educational institution as well. Uh, so I would say, um, I think a different period of time, uh, it also, you know, create lots of problem, uh, you know, for historian uh, to access the material that they need. Uh, but at the same time, I think some sometimes you also have to be a little bit more creative in, you know, thinking about a new category that actually allow us to communicate with the archival staff and also maybe to win their sympathy and support and also understanding as well. Right. I think we all have stories with archives in China wherein we get to know the archivist and suddenly they open a box they wouldn't normally open. Yeah, that's quite true. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the next question is, is something we've, that, um, that we've insisted on asking everyone, and that is uh, we were, we're most interested in, in you, clearly, but we've asked everyone to maybe recall a pleasant memory, a significant memory about another scholar in our field. Uh, something that you think about someone else could be more than one person that should be remembered in 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 our field. Um, 
I would say that person would be my, uh, you know, former, you know, uh, a mentor, you know, uh, as so as, uh, I think the late historian, you know, Professor Gary Tiedman, uh, I always, you know, consider him to be my, uh, you know, intellectual mentor, uh, the Sifu, uh, basically the one who actually nurtured my intellectual growth uh, since I was a master student at SOAS. Uh, and then later on, I think she took up, uh, she also accepted me into his PhD program as well. Um, he always, you know, uh, struck me as, you know, a kind of a role model of, you know, a detailed historian. Uh, basically, he always, you know, challenges, you know, to pay attention to the sources, uh, but at the same time, also trying to pay, trying to be sensitive to uh, the concern and also the voices of the little person, you know, in history. Uh, you know, whether, you know, whether we are talking about the boxes in Shandong or some of the Catholics, you know, in the most remote area of China or even some bandit, uh, you know, each one of them, you know, have their own uh, little story. Uh, that have to be rediscovered, you know, by historian as well. Uh, so I would say, you know, Professor Gary Tiemann always inspired me to do uh, this type of, you know, detailed, sensitive, you know, social, uh, historical research. And I always look up to him as, you know, a kind of, you know, a role model. Uh, and, and I still remember, you know, the time that, you know, we often met, you know, in his late, you know, in his office, which is very similar to yours office. Uh, basically, we just, you know, sit across the table and then he basically just revealed every single paper and also chapter that I wrote with extensive comments. Uh, so it was actually that kind of um, attention that he gave to me and also to some of the other students uh, that actually help us to grow, you know, uh, intellectually and also professionally as well. Uh, so I always, you know, uh, record those, you know, wonderful moments. Uh, sadly, I think he passed away last year, uh, but at the same time, I think his legacy actually lived on uh, through his publication and also maybe hopefully uh, for many of his students as well. Interestingly, Professor Tiedemann uh, has one of my books he reviewed very positively, and then another one of my books, he gave me the worst review I've ever received. Oh, okay. <laughs> really, it was actually a marvelous, uh, I mean, no, he liked the book, but uh, it was just a, it was a marvelous example of good critical scholarship, and he was also a good friend. So, yeah. you know, taking a critical review from a good friend is uh, somehow different, but but yeah. yes, that was a, a great story. Well, I, you know, as we approach the last question or the last two questions, I wonder if you might um, maybe share with us what hopes you have or expectations you have for the future of, of our field. Yeah, that's actually a wonderful question because I think, you know, um, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, this issue over the last few years, you know, partly because it's also getting a little bit more difficult nowadays uh, for people to pursue in-depth archival research, uh, you know, in China. Uh, but one thing that I discovered is, uh, I would say there may be three, you know, interesting, you know, a lesson or maybe, or maybe three interesting direction. Uh, one thing that I benefit most is actually to work with some, a, a new generations of young scholar. Uh, from China. Uh, over the last few years, I have been hosting a number of visiting doctoral students from Shandong University, and, and they come to the United States to do archival research. Uh, but for our conversation, I also began to, you know, see there are lots of common interests between, you know, the new generations of, you know, young scholars from China. And, and, and I always want to organize that kind of, you know, um, symposium. Uh, that actually allow them to interact, you know, with, you know, the American, you know, colleagues as well. And it was actually through this kind of interaction, I began to realize that um, I think you also have the next generations of the scholar, they are also want, I think they also want to revisit every single details of the missionary movement, you know, from a more constructive, but also critical perspective as well. So from there, you know, I think by working with them, uh, and also by collaborating with them, it also challenged me uh, to revisit my earlier work uh, on the missionary movement in Chaozhou as well. And, 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 and so I would say, you know, that one direction is, you know, the transnational collaboration with scholar, you know, from, you know, various Asian countries who are doing research on, you know, the history of Christianity in China. Uh, 
Um, I would say the other thing is actually um, maybe to you know work with uh, maybe to do some more cross disciplinary work uh, because you know increasingly uh, as China becoming much more modernized and also becoming much more well developed, uh, you also have a new generations of social scientists. Uh, who are always curious about the legacy of the missionary movement. Uh, people who work in the field of journalism, um, educational management, uh, public health care, uh, they always want to get some kind of insights from historians who work on the mission history as well. Uh, so sometimes when I you know, talk with you know, some of those professionals, it also gets me to think that you know, whatever we produce as a historical knowledge, uh, could provide some kind of historical template or, pref or, or, or reference uh, to uh, many social scientists and also maybe to many uh, medical professional, educational professional who are basically facing, who are basically trying to, you know, confront the same issue uh, in the early 20th century, uh, in the early 21st century China as well. Uh, the last thing uh, I'm also thinking is, you know, maybe some kind of, you know, community and also public outreach uh, to the faith community because um, as you know most of this you know faith community have reached uh, you know beyond you know three or fourth generation they also have you know question about the origins of their faith as well and and and, and surprisingly I think that you know by communicating by reaching out to them uh, sometimes they also have some interesting oral history that they can share and that, that would also help to enrich the scholarly research uh, on various aspects of, you know, the Christian movement as well. Uh, so I would say, you know, yeah, uh, reaching out, uh, you know, to new generations of scholars, uh, to people who work from, who work in different professions and also to, uh, you know, the faith community, you know, in the U.S. and also in, you know, different parts of, you know, Asia. I think that would also create more common grounds for dialogue. And, and I think that would actually make our research more down to earth. You mentioned something interesting, and that is a, a, what I see, too, as a re, a, an increasing hunger uh, in the faith community for a, a better historical understanding of their, of their past, yeah. you know, among Chinese Christians. Um, also, I think, doesn't, doesn't that extend even to the non-Christian community? For example, you published a marvelous book in mainland China on, uh, with a great number of really fascinating images, photographs from the missionaries. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you and I probably have both had experiences in China where we show a PowerPoint with an image and everyone raises their, their phone to take pictures of the picture because they have no access sometimes mm -hmm. to those photographs. Hmm. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, uh, you know, I remember hearing in the past many uh, Chinese scholars saying, I don't have the, the languages I need uh, to study in these various archives. But don't you think that's changing and improving quite a lot, that the younger scholars are more prepared than they used to be? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and, and I think the good thing is, I think nowadays, you know, uh, I think the Chinese educational system, they also encourage, you know, the student to go out. Uh, you know, to look for all these kind of new archival materials as well. Uh, so definitely, I would say for the younger generations of, you know, the doctoral and also for the master's student, they have far better, uh, you know, language, you know, foreign language skill. Uh, they are also much more sensitive to different kinds of academic discipline as well. Uh, so I would say, you know, I, I, I always enjoy, you know, talking to them and also working with them. Uh, and and be increasingly, you also see more, uh, you know, uh, Chinese, you know, graduate student. They are also, you know, trying to explore that kind of, you know, visual materials uh, and also the material of images and sound and, and also trying to integrate that, you know, into their scholarship as well. So I would say, you know, there are many, you know, new direction, new possibility. Uh, so I remain hopeful, actually, and also we're optimistic about our field. <laughs> right. Well, you know, uh, one question that I, I, people want me to ask you in particular is, Professor Lee, uh, and this is the, uh, not even a, a scheduled question, but many of us want to know what's next. Where, where does Professor Joseph Lee intend to go with your scholarship uh, in the next future? Because we know you have a lot of life left of research <laughs> and publishing. Yeah, uh, right now I'm actually working on uh, you know two uh, you know two two projects. Uh, one project actually deal with um, you know the early 20th century experience of those you know Chaozhou speaking uh, Christian, uh, basically how 
how they encounter the the early Republican uh, the early Republican you know stay uh, during the nineteen twenties. Uh, I I I think in that project I basically focus on the whole story of you know the anti Christian movement in Guangdong. Uh, basically, how that you know how they trying to come up with a effective strategy uh, to respond to that kind of external state you know pressure. And I do believe that that actually serve a kind of interesting model for uh, the church and state encounter in the nineteen fifties. Uh, so basically, I'm, I think mean, that is one you know historical project that I'm working on. Uh, the other one is actually the whole subject of radio evangelism. Uh, I think after nineteen forty nine you actually have uh you know uh, many uh you know chinese you know christian uh broadcasting company they were actually you know uh develop you know radio broadcast religious broadcast you know for you know the entire you know mainland chinese region uh so i began to look at some of those you know audience letter and also maybe trying to study uh you know Basically, the audience response, the reception history of radio evangelism uh, throughout the entire Maoist era, and also maybe trying to, you know, get a sense of, you know, the different form of religious revival uh, that actually happened, uh, you know, before even before the house church. Uh, so, so I think that is also the other subject that I'm working on: uh, the reception history of radio evangelism uh, in 1960 and also in 1970s. These are really great topics. We look forward to um, having those published works on our shelves. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And and with that, we are we are really. It looks like our time is out. But let me just again thank you so much for agreeing to participate in this interview series. We are all very grateful, and I know we have some summer left ahead of us. So everyone working on this project wants to convey to you good wishes for the rest of your summer. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this and thanks for the invitation. Oh, thank you.